Although we have now discussed the presentation and management of chronic COPD in detail, we also need to focus on COPD exacerbations. COPD exacerbations classically present with cardinal symptoms, which are shown in this chart here on the right-hand side of the presentation. These include an increase in dyspnea, an increase in the patient's cough, as well as a change in the color of the sputum or in the volume of the sputum. And it is essential that we recognize, diagnose, and treat COPD exacerbations, as these can ultimately progress the development of acute respiratory failure. The number one cause underlying COPD exacerbations is pulmonary infections, including strep pneumoniae, haemophilus influenzae, mycoplasma pneumoniae, Moraxella catarralis, as well as viral infections, including influenza. And as you can see here, with strep pneumonia, as well as viral infections being major causes of COPD exacerbations, this is why it is so essential that we give our patients vaccines for these infections. When a patient comes in with a suspected COPD exacerbation, it is essential that we get a chest x-ray in order to rule out pneumonia or any other potential underlying contributor to their symptoms. And in terms of the management of acute COPD exacerbations, it can be helpful to divide our interventions into those that are medications and those that are other interventions. In terms of medications, we can help our patients with the use of inhaled beta-2 agonists as well as anticholinergics. Patients with COPD exacerbations often will need systemic corticosteroids, for example, IV methylprednisolone, and we can ultimately taper this over time to oral steroids. As we will see in the coming slides, in select cases of COPD exacerbations, we will give our patients antibiotics. Typical examples of antibiotics that we will use include azithromycin, levofloxacin, and doxycycline. Although, as we will see in a moment, this will depend on whether we need anti-pseudomonal coverage. Additionally, if the patient is influenza positive, then we can also treat our patients with oseltamivir. In terms of other interventions, we can also treat our patients with supplemental oxygen with a target oxygen level of 88 to 92 percent. From there, we can use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, abbreviated as NPPV. Examples of NPPV include BiPAP as well as CPAP. And if while on NPPV, the patient still has a rising PCO2 or a rising respiratory rate, then we should really consider intubation and mechanical ventilation. Diving a bit deeper into our use of antibiotics, as we mentioned previously, we can consider the use of azithromycin, levofloxacin, and doxycycline. However, we should only give these antibiotics if the patient meets at least one of the following criteria. The first indication is if the patient has at least two out of the three cardinal symptoms. And as we mentioned previously, these cardinal symptoms include an increase in dyspnea, an increase in the patient's cough, or a change in the sputum color or sputum volume. We should also give antibiotics if the patient goes on to require mechanical ventilation. As we hinted at previously, it is also important when considering our antibiotic selection in the case of a COPD exacerbation that we consider whether we need to cover pseudomonas, as this is the case in patients who have what we refer to as complicated COPD. We will therefore give antibiotics with anti-pseudomonal coverage, for example, fluoroquinolones, cefepime, or piperacillotazobactam, if the patient meets at least one of the following criteria, including being greater than 65 years old, having an FEV1 that is less than 50%, or having more than two exacerbations in the past year. As having any of these criteria means that the patient qualifies as having complicated COPD and therefore has a higher risk of having a pseudomonas infection. As we mentioned previously, we are going to give our patients supplemental oxygen to keep them with a goal range of 88 to 92 percent saturation. However, if we are unable to maintain this, then we can consider the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or NPPV, examples of which include BiPAP as well as CPAP. The use of NPPV, whether BiPAP or CPAP, in the context of COPD exacerbations has been shown to decrease mortality as well as to decrease the need for intubation 
and therefore we should really consider using MPPV before progressing to considering mechanical ventilation. Indications for the use of MPPV include, of course, COPD exacerbations. However, other potential indications include cardiogenic pulmonary edema, acute respiratory failure, as well as in helping us to extubate a patient early in other contexts. However, in scenarios where our non-invasive NPPV measures are not sufficient for our patients with COPD exacerbations, then we should move on to intubation with mechanical ventilation, which of course is an invasive procedure. Indications for progressing to the use of intubation and mechanical ventilation in our patients with COPD exacerbations include in cases where our patient has hypercapnia with altered mental status, for example, decreased responsiveness or inability to clear respiratory secretions. Additionally, having a COPD exacerbation in which the patient also has unstable vital signs or severe acidemia, defined as a pH less than 7.1, are also grounds for considering intubation. The other indication for progressing to intubation and mechanical ventilation in our COPD exacerbation patients is if our patient fails a two-hour trial of NPPV. In this case, our non-invasive measures are not sufficient to maintain proper oxygenation and decrease the patient's hypercapnia, and therefore we are going to really need mechanical ventilation. Please note, however, from these indications that hypercapnia alone is not an indication for intubation. We need to see evidence of hypercapnia with altered mental status in order to justify moving from our non-invasive ventilation to our invasive intubation and mechanical ventilation. And this is a very high yield principle to keep in mind for examinations. We've included a couple of schematics here just to drive home the key differences here between MPPV and our invasive intubation with mechanical ventilation. In the case of NPPV, as shown here in the example of CPAP, however, as would also be the case with BiPAP, you can see here that the ventilation is going to be non-invasive. This does not involve sticking a tube down the patient's throat or doing any sort of invasive procedure. Rather, the patient is simply wearing a mask to help with his ventilation. In contrast, in the case of intubation with mechanical ventilation, of course, this is going to involve an invasive procedure of essentially sticking this tube down the patient's throat. And therefore, when we are managing our patients with COP exacerbations, we really want to initiate with our non-invasive ventilation before ultimately progressing to intubation with mechanical ventilation, if necessary. COPD has several high yield complications that we will need to keep in mind. As we have now hammered home at this point, COPD exacerbations, of course, are a major complication of this disease. Additionally, patients are at an increased risk for the development of polycythemia, secondary to an increase in erythropoietin production. COPD patients are also at an increased risk of developing pulmonary hypertension, which could ultimately progress to right heart failure and thus core pulmonale. Having COPD is also a risk factor for the development of a pneumothorax in which patients have a rupture of pleural blebs. And we have here a classic chest x-ray with an example here of a pneumothorax on this patient's right side. Patients with COPD are also at an increased risk of the development of arrhythmias, including multifocal atrial tachycardia. And as we have noted in separate modules, COPD, as well as one of the medications that COPD patients often take, theophylline, are both independent risk factors for the development of this arrhythmia. We have now brought up alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency multiple times throughout this series. However, I'd like to just go into this condition in detail. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, our classic patient is going to be a non-smoker who is under the age of 45, who develops COPD. This younger age of developing COPD compared to our typical patient is really a key tip-off for suggesting that this is a case of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. However, another key clue that you may see in a patient vignette is that in the case of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the involvement is going to be basilar predominant, meaning that this is primarily going to destroy the lower lobes. This is as a result of the panacinar emphysema that develops in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency 
which preferentially destroys the lower lobes. Therefore, if you see a patient who has COPD involvement that is primarily affecting the lower lobes or particularly affecting the basilar segments of the lungs, then you should really think about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. In addition to pulmonary complications, these patients are also at an elevated risk of liver disease, including cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And also, being that this is a genetic disorder, in particular with a co-dominant inheritance, you really want to also investigate for family history, because this can be an additional clue for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. As we mentioned on the previous slide, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is inherited in an autosomal co-dominant fashion. Just to go through this briefly, in our patients, M is considered to be the normal allele for alpha-1 antitrypsin, whereas Z is an abnormal allele that is deficient in antitrypsin. Therefore, if our patient inherits M and M, they are considered to be normal. If they inherit MZ, because this is an autosomal co-dominant condition, the patient may be normal or may have a slightly elevated risk for the development of COPD. However, if the patient inherits two abnormal alleles, meaning ZZ, then that patient will be at an extremely high risk for the development of COPD as well as the other sequelae of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, including cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Overall, the pathophysiology of this condition is, of course, a deficiency of antiprotease. Without sufficient alpha-1 antitrypsin, this is going to lead to an excess of elastase, which is ultimately going to lead to destruction of the alveolar walls, and thus the development of early-onset COPD. In order to diagnose this disorder, we can order a serum alpha-1 antitrypsin level. Additionally, as this is a genetic disorder, we can also use PCR in order to arrive at a diagnosis. Generally speaking, we are going to use the same management of our patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as we do with our other patients with COPD in that we simply manage their COPD symptoms, such as smoking or occupational exposures. Additionally, in some patients, they may benefit from the use of intravenous alpha-1 antitrypsin in order to elevate the level of this enzyme, thus curing the deficiency. That'll do it for now in our discussion of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Based on my working with many, many students over the years, I feel like the highest yield points to take away from this series is really regarding the COPD exacerbations, as well as how to manage those exacerbations, including indications for the use of antibiotics, the use of non-invasive ventilation prior to progressing to mechanical ventilation, as well as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. In subsequent modules, we will cover both asthma and bronchiectasis in detail. This is Boards MD, and this is COPD.